Good morning. I was just saying to Cal that I was ready too soon and I was sure that I had forgotten something. I'm ready now. <laughs> and I hope you are too, uh, to be about worshiping God and engaging in the fellowship of the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, friends, there are two announcements in your bullets in there. One, just a reminder that we are doing our intergenerational storytelling and potluck event today. And uh, so come on down. Don't worry about if you didn't bring something. I'm sure there's more than enough uh, for everybody to get something. So come down and, and we're going to be telling uh, some stories with one another and uh, learning together how God works through stories with us. Also, I want you to uh, remember that next month is our quarterly leadership chat. So after worship is over, I'll stay here and I may have some of our church leaders stay present with me uh, to share with you updates and also to answer any questions you might have about where we are and what's happening and who's doing what. So these chats are meant to be uh, informational and to provide you with um, some clarity about if you've got questions about things. So we hope that you'll stay. They usually aren't more than uh, 20 to 30 minutes long, if that. So please, uh, if you're going to be with us next week, plan to stay and have some conversation with us. Let us join our hearts and minds and be in a worship spirit. I invite you to turn in your bulletin to our call to worship and let us read responsively. You are our only security, O Lord. In you we find refuge. Everything that is good comes from you, O Lord. You give us guidance and make our hearts glad. You lead us in the path of In your presence there is fullness of joy. Friends, let us sing our first hymn, number 688. We'll do verses 1, 4, and 5.
To God we can always turn. Let us pray with all sincerity and trusting God to respond. Please join me in the prayer of confession. O oh God, our protector, we seek to be counted among the godly and upright, but we confess that we have run after other powers, and we have brought trouble upon ourselves and others. O oh Lord, our portion and our cup, you sustain us and lead us in good and pleasant ways. We confess that we have trusted in false wisdom and set our hearts on short-sighted desires. Forgive us, God, our life. Help us set you always before us and sustain us in your righteousness. In the name of the one who saves us and shows us the way. Amen. Let our hearts be glad, our spirits rejoice, and our bodies rest in hope. For the Lord does not abandon us to our sin, or let us dwell in the pit. In Christ, you show us the path of life. You welcome us into the joy of your presence. You feed us with pleasures forevermore. Amen. join me in the prayer for understanding. O oh God, you alone are our judge. Send your spirit of truth to expose our self-deception and challenge our complacency so that we may surrender to your mercy and follow your will for Jesus Christ, our liberator. Amen. A reading from the whole Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell on the path and was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered for lack of moisture. Some fell on th among thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it. Some fell into good soil, and when it grew, it produced a hundredfold. As he said this, he called out, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. Then his disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive, and listening they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones on the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe only for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. 
As for those what fell among the thorns, these are the ones who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. But as for that in the good soil, these are the ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patient endurance. I'd like to invite the young disciples to come up. illustrations. Hold on. All right. Well, Jesus, Jesus told the people a story about a sower who sowed some seeds. And so I wondered what you knew about growing things and planting seeds and such. Anything? Uh, well, my guess is you know a few things, but you might be a little shy to say. Like you know that the seed has to be planted in the ground, right? And once it's in the ground, it starts to sprout. First roots, has to do the roots first. And then slowly there'll be some uh, leaves or some stems coming up from the ground. And soon enough, the roots keep growing and the stem keeps growing. And this one is a picture of wheat. And then the grain finally grows. That's where the fruit is, or what they call the fruit, the harvest, is these seeds at the top. That's what we make into flour, which we make into bread and cookies. Sounds like a good thing? Yeah. So, so that's kind of how it, now the trees, fruit trees work the same way. You have to plant it in the soil, the seed, and then it grows roots and then ultimately a stem, which we call the trunk and branches. And then the branches have flowers on them sometimes if they're fruit trees, because we need the bees to, to pollinate them. And then from the flowers come the fruit. Does that sound pretty good? Well, Jesus was saying to us that our life of faith is like a plant, like a seed that gets dropped into the ground and grows and is nurtured until it bears some kind of fruit. Does that sound like too much? <laughs> More importantly this morning, I just want to remind you how fascinating I think it is that God has created all of these plants and trees and gives them growth through the water, which they, they take up through the roots and the sunlight that they take in through the, the leaves. And how wonderful it is that God has created all of this so that we might have bread and fruit and things to eat. Does that sound like a good thing that God did? Yeah. So whenever you see things growing, remember that not only is it what's the plant there, but it's also the other ways that God nurtures it or, or feeds it with water and sunlight, and that we also have a role to play sometimes in this process. Okay? All right. Shall we say a prayer of thanksgiving then? Let's do that. Gracious God, we thank you for the gift of seeds and plants and trees and fruit. We give thanks for the way that you have created all these glorious things so that we and all creation might be fed. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for the wonderful ways that you take care of us and take care of the world. Amen. Thank you for coming up.
So the window that we've uh, decided to draw your attention to is the last window in the line, the peace, love, and joy window. It was given by Jean Gordon in loving memory of her husband, William E. Gordon, better known to those who knew him as Bill. Bill and Jean were charter members of St. Luke. Bill held positions during his tenure at the church and died in January of 77 after a long illness. The windows bear the words love, peace, and joy. These were taken from a benediction that Ken Stewart used to say, may the peace of God that passes all understanding, the love of God that never lets you go, and the joy of God that no man may take from you. May all of these be yours today and all your days forever. Amen. So the text I chose to connect with this was this text from Galatians. But I want to begin with just a brief introduction about this letter to the Galatians and in particular this text. Paul is trying to invite the people to be about the spiritual work that they need to be doing. And so we contrast the spirit and the flesh. But I want to remind you that the flesh is not bad. Flesh is created by God. It is a part of all of who we are. God understands that we need to attend to the flesh. It's the abuses of the flesh that Paul is talking about. So please listen to these words from Galatians 5. For freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single command, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit, and what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, Strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, may we be led by the Spirit this day to grow in ways that bear the fruits of the Spirit and to know that even in our growing, you are present and providing for us. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, interestingly enough, as I wrestled with these two passages, I kept being brought back to the parable of the sower. And I'm hoping by the end I can help connect these two for you. I love the parable of the sower. It seems obvious, right? Or at least to those of us who have grown up in the church and heard it told over and over in Sunday school and in in Bible studies and in church. 
It's a parable that we know. It's a parable that perhaps we've had to act out at one time or another. And yet it still invites us to pause and think about it. This is the joy of parables. Jesus spoke often in parables, and in our Bible study, we discussed quite a bit about why Jesus would use parables, especially when sometimes people didn't seem to get the, the meaning behind them. Even the disciples, in this case, quietly pulled Jesus aside and say, we didn't get it. Can you imagine being a student of Jesus and traveling with Jesus and knowing Jesus and having to say to him, yeah, I love your stories, but I don't get them. But Jesus expects this. In fact, the reason Jesus speaks in parables is because they invite participation. They invite conversation and wondering. They begin with a story, a reminder of something we already know. So when Jesus tells the parable of the sower, people are imagining in their mind a scene that they see regularly in their community. Of a sower who goes out and scatters the seed in the field in the planting season. And Jesus says, you know what happens to the seed. Some of the seed will fall on the path and the birds come down and eat it up. Some of it will fall on rocky ground and it won't have enough roots so that when the sun comes out and scorches it, it just dies and falls over. Some of it will fall amongst the weed. And when they grow up together, the plant and the weed, the weed will choke it. And some of it will fall in good soil. I love this story because I love the abundance and the abandonment of the sower when he sows. Now, he's not intentionally throwing it on rocky soil or amongst weeds. But when you want to do it in abundance, sometimes that happens. How many of you have wandered past the field from time to time and found something unusual, something unexpected growing there? And you wonder, how did the seed get here? Perhaps by those birds that gathered it up and carried it away, right? I'm reminded, too, that the weeds and the birds are not the bad guys in this. The beads help us seed the world. I mean, the birds help us to seed the world. And, and the weeds, or what we like to call weeds, you know, help with erosion, keep the water from taking away everything that's of value. So. Even the rocky soil is not a negative thing, although when you're trying to plant, it's not necessarily a good thing. There's a, another story that's told in Israel about how God gave a couple of angels buckets of stones and told them to go out and scatter them in the world. One angel scattered her across the whole universe. The other one dumped them right there in Israel. Either way, Jesus begins with a story that is very familiar, that draws us in, that's something we already know. And then he invites us to go deeper, to think harder, to wonder more. What is he trying to say by this? We know this. What is he trying to say? And of course, Jesus is trying to help both the disciples and the crowd that have gathered and listened to this story to understand how the Word of God works in us and grows in us and hopefully bears fruit in us. And by word, we mean Scripture, but beyond Scripture, we also mean the purpose of God's kingdom, the, the, the reason God is calling us into being, the love that God has for us, all of this. In Matthew, it's clear it's the kingdom. And in Luke, he mentions the kingdom, but then says it's the word. It's what God is planting in us. We are the soil, right? Hopefully, good soil. 
that's going to produce. So this morning, I want to invite you to ponder a little bit about this parable. What has God seeded in you with abundance and abandon? Is it something that you are nurturing into growth? Is it something that you are making sure that you're attending to? Is it something that will bear fruit? So I wonder how many of you feel like you have grown in your faith in the past few years. How many of you still hold your faith maybe that you were confirmed with? How many of you are longing for something more in your faith than you have right now? Or how many of you maybe have, you know, found these last couple of years really tough on your faith? Pandemics and war, natural disasters, violence. We seem sometimes not to learn, not to move forward, not to progress and grow as God calls us to grow. And then I think about the plant itself. If we go with the parable and God or Christ is the sower, then what responsibility does God have in our growth? God provides the sun and the rain. To be quite honest, God has provided the soil. God has provided all of us. God has even provided the sea. Everything has been provided. And still, we are invited to grow. Not to stay as we are, but to change and to bear fruit. Fruit that is peace and love and joy and all those other things that Paul listed. Now, I have to admit that growth, growing and planting and, and harvesting, those are seasonal things, right? You don't harvest in the same period that you plant and you don't uh, grow in the same series in, that you're harvesting. I mean, you've grown already, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's seasonal. So there are times when things are being planted. That's that underground work. That's that root work that's taking place. I'll have to ask my gardeners later if I'm misleading you in any way. And then there's the growth period, the sun and the water, and then the plant, you know, becomes bigger and bigger and starts to flower, and then once it does bear fruit, then there's the harvesting time, there's the gathering in. And even after that, there's a rest period. There's a fallow season there where the soil is being healed and renewed, right? Am I good? All right. I want us to think a little bit about that about in our own lives, that there have been seasons where things have been planted, and maybe sometimes we didn't even realize it was being planted in us. And then there are seasons where we're obviously growing, we're being challenged, we're wondering, we're changing. And hopefully there's a season then where we're bearing the fruit of all of that growth and the harvest. And then there's always a time for rest. So I wonder again, can you think of a time recently where something has been seeded in you? Something God has put in your heart, in your mind, within you, and called you to grow. Pushing your way through the soil, stretching your leaves and your stems, your branches and becoming something more than you were before. Now, I've had a couple of occasions where I can obviously point to this. One of them was about 15 years ago when I worked with a small church on the north side of, of the presbytery that was struggling to survive trying to figure out how they were going to be the church in the future when they couldn't seem to attract new members, when the costs of the building were becoming extreme. 
when folks were tiring of doing the same jobs over and over again. We discovered that there were several churches in that area that were struggling the same way. And God put into our hearts this desire to be present for each other, to support each other and attend to each other as we struggled together with these same challenges. What came out of that was a conversation about merging. And let me just say, whenever you mention the word merge in a church, people get all weird. (laughs) You know, what does that mean? Where will we have to go? How will we be? Will we still be our church? We as pastors try to avoid the word as much as possible. We talked about things like organic growth or organic union. We thought we were fooling them. When one day at one of our retreats, one of the elders say, are we gonna talk about merger or not? But it wasn't just enough to talk about merger. We then had to talk about what God was calling us to be and how that might be different from anything we had been before and how we might bear new fruit in the communities that we were part of. Six churches started in the fellowship, the conversation. Four churches agreed to talk about it seriously. Two churches merged. Those churches have met in a railroad station and in a theater, and they are now part of an affordable housing unit on the north side, and their church is on the bottom floor. They were open to the seeds that God was planting in them. They were open to the potential of being something altogether different. And they nurtured all of the crazy ideas that were coming through the people in the midst of prayer and Bible study. And it was a time of growth for me as a pastor too because I had no clue where we were going. I had no clue what it would be. All I needed to do was attend to the seeds that God had planted at that time and to help others see that God had planted something new within them. Now, the most recent time of growth for me has been in our work on anti-racism. God planted a seed a long time ago in me that Help me to understand and know that all of us are God's children. All of us are created equal. All of us have a place, not only in the church, but in the world. And that we should be protected and loved and have opportunities. But somehow that seed seemed to flounder in the soil. I had way more other things to be concerned about in the church, declining membership and, you know, and preaching every Sunday and taking care of the poor. How am I going to attend to this issue that I hardly understand? More recently, God seems to have watered that seed and put the sun, the light on that seed in a way that's called me to speak on it often to people in my church, to people in my family, to folks I meet in community. God has, put, has, has created such growth in me that I understand how I am part of the problem in the sense of my complacency and in my silence. <clears throat> There are many challenges in our world that God has seeded solutions for in the church. And we are called as members of this body to nurture that in one another. And we do that by gathering on Sunday morning to be present with each other, to support one another, to pray for one another. We do that in our study of scripture throwing ourselves into the roots of our faith and attending to those roots. We do that as we enter into the community with service and love. We are nurturing the life of that plant. 
But what we need to be clear about is that we do need to be about the work of nurturing these seeds within us. They can be too easily swept away by the birds, by, by other issues, other concerns in our lives. They can be too quickly lost because our roots do not go deep enough. We don't know the stories. We don't attend to the stories of who we are and whose we are. It can die, it can grow up quickly and die because we lack the energy, the enthusiasm, the commitment, because we get too busy with other things and the seed, the plant is strangled. Interestingly enough in this parable, which isn't un, you know, is, happens from time to time, in the beginning, we are the soil. By the end, we are the plant. Do you see that? In the beginning, it's about where that seed falls and how that seed is nurtured. In the end, it's about how that seed grows and bears fruit and becomes the harvest. Ultimately, we also become the sower. Because as Jesus explained all this to the disciples, he said there are some who are not going to hear this or not be ready to hear this or not be aware of the seed that has been planted in them. You are going to have to be about that. You are going to have to be the ones to nurture this in them. You are the ones that need to scatter these seeds amongst the people. In fact, the next parable that Jesus tells is about a light. And he says, you don't light a lamp and then put it under a bushel. You put it on a table for all to see. Indeed, God has planted something in you. I have no doubt about that. I see the growth happening in different ways in different people, but we need to encourage it. We need to attend to it. We cannot just expect that it'll grow on its own. We need to be aware of the ways that God has gifted us so that we might bear the fruit, fruit of the Spirit. Amen? So we're going to sing one of my favorite songs in the hymn book number 223. Now, how many of you know the motions to I've got peace like a river? Come on, some of you know them. I need some help up here to do the motions. Oh, come on, be a brave soul. See, Fred's not here this morning. Where's, oh, Fred, come on, you know the motions to this, come on. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so uh, somebody tell me the order of the verses. Peace, joy, love, okay? So I've got peace like a river in my soul. Okay, is that, you know? I've got peace like a river in my soul. Now, you all do joy like this, right? Okay, we do joy like this, like a fountain. Joy like a fountain. So, okay, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul, okay? And then the last one is love like the ocean, right? So I've got love like the ocean in my soul. Okay, now, you're best to watch these others because somewhere in the midst of this, I will lose track of my motions. But stand up, we're gonna sing this together. It's a good one for your, to get your body moving to take in some deep breaths, okay? And again, only if you feel comfortable and able, actually, only if you feel able. No one feels comfortable doing this. It's silly and it's fun. Okay, so are we ready? All right.
blessings of this life, we give you thanks, O Creator God. For families and friends and colleagues and neighbors and people we've yet to know and meet, all who nurture us, that the love of God might grow within them and us. That your love and your word is like a seed and would grow in all of us to produce good fruit. We pray too that your love would be like a seed taking root and growing strong in the leaders of our nations and cities and communities that they would be led to lead with strong hearts and gentle hands and generous spirits, with compassion and mercy, with wisdom and grace. May they reflect your will guiding all their actions and decisions. May your love be like a seed taking root and growing strong. For those who serve in harm's way, for those who live in the midst of violence, for those who experience natural disasters and sometimes not so natural disasters, for those who live in fear or worry about their employment, their bills, their food, who struggle to find dignity in life. May your grace bring peace and safety to all people, one to another. May your love be like a seed taking root and growing strong for those who suffer from any kind of illness or disease of body, mind, or spirit. Restore these and all those we carry in our hearts to the fullness of health. Health as only you know, O oh God, can bring. May your mercy shower each of us with healing mercy and love. Lord, we ask that you would be present with those we've named here today, those recovering from illness or from accident, those who have been traveling, those who are struggling with changes in their mental capacity and their physical capacities, for those hospitalized and at home. We lift up to you also those within our country and our communities that do not feel welcomed, that do not feel like they have rights, that do not always feel protected and celebrated. We lift up to you those people in Ukraine as they struggle under the oppressive conditions of war, the violence to their way of life and to their families. We would lift up to you also those who are celebrating today, celebrating families gathering, celebrating birthdays, celebrating things growing in our yard and in our community. Lord, we ask that you would bless all folks and continue to nurture in each one of them your love and your purpose. May your love be like a seed taking root and growing strong for those who are dying and for those who have died. Send forth your comforting love, give solace to those who mourn, console all who grieve. May your grace surround us like a mantle upon our heads, a shawl upon our shoulders, a hand to hold. May your love be like a seed taking root and going strong in all of us. We give you thanks for the gift of stories that Jesus told. And we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The earth and all it contains belongs to the Lord, the world and those who live in it. And God is the one who provides all that we need for this living, living in abundance and in fulfillment. Because God has provided all we need, all that we are asked to do is share what we have. This morning, I remind you that you can make a gift to the church and to its mission and ministry by uh, putting an envelope in the plate as you leave or um, by going online and doing it online. But in all times, we remember that we contribute to the mission and the ministry of Christ not because we have to, but because we are compelled by our gratitude. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we thank you for this glorious world that you have made and that you have included us in it. We give thanks this day for all that you have seeded, planted within us and within the earth. We ask, Lord, that you would just give us the growth so that we might bear fruit in this community, the fruit of the Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, our, first, our last hymn is number 408, Let Us Stand and Sing Together. And please feel free to sway and move if the Spirit leads you. <clears throat> from the prophet Isaiah, surely God's word will not return to God empty and it will not be in vain. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, 
so shall my word be to those that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall be accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I have sent it. May the God of the harvest, the gatherer, the gardener supreme, be with you in your growing. Feed and equip and provide for you. May you look towards a different harvest, a fruitful life in service to God and others. And may the God of the harvest feed us, prune us, harvest us, that our lives might bring glory to God. Amen. <laughs>